Uh, my name is Perry. I'm a software engineer at Snap. Uh, I've been there for two years and primarily focusing on how can we deliver the Snapchat app and its core features to our users uh, as fast as possible. And interestingly enough, when I got there, Snapchat was always continuously deployed. Um, it's one of the advantages when you start from scratch and you have one big monolith, which is something we'll talk about how we're breaking it apart today. Uh, but before that, I wanted to make a huge shout out to the community, the contributors, uh, sponsors, speakers, everyone, new users and their input that helps us that we're kind of in our own little box and seeing how new users interact with Spinnaker. But I wanted to get a big round of applause for everyone that's helped me along the way and I couldn't have made it without all of your guys' help. So, please <laughs> So yeah, so, it's been, so Snapchat had a monolithic problem, which is probably similar to what many of you have dealt with here. So Snapchat, famously or infamously, has always been a huge App Engine customer. So what is App Engine? App Engine is kind of a platform as a service that's offered on the Google Cloud. You just kind of make a container, or you make like your code, and you just kind of deploy it from your laptop, and it shows up, and it's auto scale, and it's great. Where does it go wrong, though? Uh, people just tend to build everything in the one same API, right? We have a new feature, let's just merge it into master and it was just like, it shows up in the API, we're good. Like, who cares if that feature was uh, in the proper place or was able to be regionalized because App Engine by design can't regionalize. So at least not about a few tricks. So where do we go up there? Uh, we have a bunch of different options we could do, but we decided on the service mesh at Snap. And why is that? Because Snap is wanting to be and is a multi-cloud company. So we want to have uh, the best experience for our users and our developers as needed. So if there's something that a developer really wants to use in AWS, then they should be able to use that in conjunction with features that were developed for Google. And we want to make it easy for our developers to understand uh, the, the boundaries or not have to even think about the cloud boundary or how they would even talk to each other. So then, what is a service mesh? People probably have heard of Istio, and you might have read the docs, and your eyes glazed over. Uh, I know I did the first time. So at the end of the day, a service mesh is a pretty s simple architecture if you just break it down to its core. Uh, all it really means is that you take the networking stack and you put it with your application. So what that allows you to do is you can make changes out of band to your networking stack without having to change your cloud or having to change uh, routing key, like routing tables or anything crazy uh, in that sort of way. So that also enables like service discovery. So we can like auto discover when somebody deploys a new service instead of like going into my like YAML file and saying add these four new IPs uh, in Snap Service Mesh, it automatically will route those to the sidecar. And one of the most interesting things about this architecture, it eliminates the need for load balancers. So we only have essentially four load balancers. Uh, in the mesh uh, that handle a lot of traffic. So basically everyone's in their own network, they talk on like a very private VPC, you have great latency, you don't have to worry about making mistakes and accidentally going to your public IP and going into the internet and coming back in because we designed it so you just can't. So that's basically what a service mesh is. So as you can see though, it's quite a bit more moving parts to deal with. Uh, so that means we have more services now, we don't just have one big monolithic app, it was like, oh, we just deployed this app and now Snapchat's updated, right? New features, like we just shipped like memories or something. It's, it's going, it's really good to go. Uh, now we're actually roll out hundreds of new features, right? And they're all separate services, which is by design a better way to move. But that creates a lot of problems with how are we gonna deploy this? Like how do we bridge the gap between these services that might have to rely on App Engine or like rely on some like a legacy service, but it has to be deployed in conjunction with the Mesh app. Uh, and that's where the division of the one deployment tool came about. So I owned the deployment tool that was deploying all the Snapchat web app, and uh, I was tasked with like, how could we support the service mesh, or like, how could we make this initiative work better? And my vision was that deployment tool was not well suited for deploying Kubernetes, and I didn't want to sit here all day trying to like update SDKs every time a uh, cloud decided to change how a GCLB or LB gets. Uh, propagated in a system or how it behaves. So we found Spinnaker that was being adopted by multiple clouds. They like, kept it up to date reasonably. Uh, it solved a lot of problems with like T 
teams that would come to us, you might have had this happen in your work, where like, well, I need to deploy like a Cloud Foundry thing, and like I need to use data stacks or blah, blah, blah. Uh, you could say like, well, yeah, it kind of supports it. If it doesn't, you can check real quick and be like, is it on the roadmap? Uh, and you know, people have their weird ad hoc deployment scripts that people get really attached to their scripts. They're like, I spent four weeks getting this Python script working. I'm not giving it up. But my cold dead body, are you going to make me do anything else? Uh, that was a tough challenge, uh, so, so we just had to like basically just win by design uh, on that one. There's still some people out there that are like that. Uh, and then like our deployment velocity was just going up by an insane amount, right? Like in the old world, we were very happy if we got 35 deployments in a day, which is quite a lot for that large amount of traffic. But still, now we can deploy much faster because it can be safer. Like if like a small feature and you can't like, for instance, see an icon on your friend in the friend feed, that's not a huge deal. But if the before, if that outage happened, it would actually take out the entire app. So now you can just mitigate risk. And you know, no one really knew how to deploy the Kubernetes. Like it wasn't really a great story around that a year and a half ago. Like people were just like, just just kube apply, it's fine. Like make a Jenkins job, kube apply, it's all you ever need. Uh, that, I didn't believe in that, uh, and people were trying to, trying to figure out, surprisingly, they didn't like that there was no visualization in Kubernetes. Uh, GKE kind of had some, but like it wasn't consistent across the clouds. So what does this enable us? So when we have a standardized infrastructure, a standardized networking stack and metrics and everything else, which is kind of the encompassing of our mesh platform, like we control the sidecars, we control the auth, what does that allow us to do? That allows us to know things about their cluster. We know that we can propagate Spinnaker's credentials to that cluster so that I can do stuff to that Spin the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we know what their metric naming scheme is going to be ahead of time so we can make a Cayenta canary uh, that config that works for all mesh services. And this enables us to know what region they're in because by design we keep track of it in our control plane that you're in which availability and failure zones you're in and that allows us to do zonal rollouts for instance or regional rollouts. Uh, automated pipelines and stuff like that. So that's what we'll get to now. Like, so how today can a Snap developer make a Spinnaker deployment pipeline? So we kind of took a different route than some of the like uh, infrastructure as code thing here to start. Uh, we have our own service that sits side with Spinnaker that allows us to generate mesh-based configs. So why do we do that? Uh, it's because we need to, we have a whole bunch of metadata sources and microservices that we can query to get all the information I need uh, to onboard a cluster to Spinnaker. So today we use uh, the Spring Cloud config GitHub uh, integration. You might have gone to Scott's talk earlier today, I believe. Um, and that's kind of what we use. So all new accounts come in through our provisioning service in the mesh because we handle provisioning, not our developers. That's key. So they can't sit there and like make themselves open in the internet and remove all our back. So we provision the RMAC, we know it's all there, we message a service that onboards it to Spinnaker, and Spinnaker picks up all new clusters within give or take eight minutes, which is a huge, huge advantage from the old two hours for all of my cloud driver pods to refresh. So what does that look like today? So this is kind of like, I didn't have time to go into like what this whole UI is, but this is a switchboard UI. So this would be like kind of like our UI or Istio has some sort of equivalent. Uh, all of our services hang out in this UI. So when you make a new service on the service mesh at Snap, you come into this UI, you say you want to make a service, we provision some sort of identity for you that you can use. You say, here's my team members, they're in this Google group, and that allows your team members to now also manage the service. So this is great because this allows you to just collaborate really quickly. You can say, we know ownership of services, which is key. Like, how many people have dealt with that at your work? You're like, what is this stupid service that's crashing? Who owns this thing? Uh, like and you're trying to find the GitHub commits and then five people who that worked there four years ago and you don't know who owns it. This solves the ownership problem. So going back and from there, where did we get to today? So we started off about a year ago and we've been onboarding since then. And now we've gone up to, in the latest month, we've done 10,000 pipeline runs. So that's an execution of a pipeline to completion. Uh, 300 unique pipelines run, so 300 different unique pipeline configs are run, and also 70 different applications. And we have about a little over 170 developers that use it uh, every month. Um, so it's been working pretty well for us, and it's been really good to get better deployment handle on our system. So that's it for me. I uh, hope you enjoyed the conference, and thanks a lot.